Admiral Linda Fagan made history when she became the 27th Commandant of the Coast Guard in June. She's the first woman to ever lead a military branch and the Coast Guard's first female four-star admiral. Admiral, welcome to the program. Thank you, Mimi. It's a pleasure to be here. So I, I want to start with your priorities. And I know um, in a document called The Commandant's Intent, you named transforming the workforce as one of your biggest priorities. Why is that? Yeah, without workforce, we are not able to operate the organization. And uh, you, we operate a uh, talent management system very similar to the other uh, armed services. Uh, you basically, whether you're officer enlisted, you start at the beginning, at the bottom, and then work your way uh, up and forward in an up route system. And uh, that creates uh, barriers and uh, impediments for people who are looking to serve and stay. And so I've challenged the team uh, to openly uh, you know, question some of those assumptions that uh, we have in the system and are looking to uh, make it easier for people to uh, enter the service and serve and uh, contribute to the nation. But how? What are some of the ideas that you're thinking so, so, about? Some of what we're doing uh, is uh, providing opportunities for, uh, for people to lateral. Uh, let's say you're a, a nurse practitioner, helicopter mechanic. Uh, we make you start at the bottom and come up. We're looking for opportunities to bring you in at an E4, E5 level uh, and bring those credentials and have us acknowledge and accept them uh, so that it's not uh, starting from the very beginning. Uh, looking for opportunities so that people can, uh, can perhaps uh, have increased geographic stability and stay, uh, stay in one place a little longer than the, um, you know, kind of right now we move people every two to four years. It's not a, a rigid um, movement, but that, that creates uh, challenges for families uh, you know, we recruit an individual, but then we retain families in creating a policy that is responsive to the workforce that we're actually recruiting is a big, big part of the focus. So really, it's it's about flexibility and it's about, you know, maybe somebody wants to serve for a while in the Coast Guard, get some experience in a different part of the government or in, in the private sector. And then would they be able to come back to the Coast Guard? So that we are looking at any and all policies that allow that increased flexibility. And so... Uh, or if somebody, the example uh, you just gave, we need to make it easy for people to do that. Or if they're serving in one of the other services and they'd like to come to us, we need to make it easy for that uh, to happen as well. And so the great thing is this is mostly policy. Uh, we've got the authority to do much of this work now. We just need to get after uh, some of those uh, very rigid approaches that we've taken traditionally. And recruitment is a big issue, not just for the services, for the government as a whole. Is there something that you're doing that can convince people in the first place that the Coast Guard is where they want to be? Yeah, so recruiting is a challenge, and this is not unique uh, to the Coast Guard. All of the military services face, uh, face this challenge. There's a shrinking group of people who uh, are uh, qualified to serve, interested in serving, and so we need to be really uh, deliberate as we seek, uh, seek those uh, people with a propensity to, uh, to serve. And, and then we need to make it easy for them to, uh, to, to stay. And so this is why this uh, talent management and workforce work is so critical. Uh, I think, you know, bonuses are, are being used in some cases, but if you don't fundamentally have a system that people see themselves serving in, see themselves staying in, uh, it's a, a bonus is just a short-term uh, solution to a, a longer-term uh, challenge. You know, we, we need talent. I'm hiring talent. We're, it's a great organization, and uh, we're, we're looking uh, to bring any and all that have that propensity to serve uh, into the service, and then we provide great opportunity once they come. Admiral, another challenge uh, for every branch is mental health, and unfortunately, suicide rates are ticking yes. up. What are you doing to bring that number down? Yeah, so we unfortunately have experienced a number of suicides uh, this year, and unfortunately every year have uh, suicides. Uh, one suicide is one too many. It's just a, a tragedy on so many uh, levels. And so uh, we are working to uh, increase access to mental health care. We've hired some uh, mental health care uh, professionals so that uh, people who are seeking help have increased access to that help. We're working through our chaplain corps to uh, increase access to assist and safe talk training so that uh, people in the workforce can get training so that they are comfortable and understand how to intervene when somebody may reach out or uh, you know, cry for help uh, from a uh, suicide prevention standpoint. It's really an all hands on deck uh, approach. We, uh, uh, we are really committed to uh, supporting the workforce and uh, you know, breaking, breaking 
uh, the chain that, that too often results in the tragedy of suicide is important work. Earlier this year, we spoke to the former commandant, uh, Admiral Schultz, and he told us that the Coast Guard was slightly behind on its modernization um, plans, but it was on a good trajectory. Where are you now? So I think uh, you're talking about our acquisition. Uh, we are in the largest acquisition uh, that we've had ongoing since, uh, since World War II, uh, polar security cutters, uh, offshore patrol cutters, waterway commerce cutters. I'm really excited about the new state-of-the-art uh, assets that we are we're uh, building and will field for the nation. Uh, the, the nation has not built a, a icebreaker or polar security cutter since the mid-70s. And uh, when, that, uh, when that asset comes online, it'll create just great presence and opportunity uh, for us as a nation to ensure, uh, ensure our sovereignty. I, I'm really, I'm committed to continuing that work, that acquisition work that my predecessors have started. And, and as you said, this is the largest recapitalization in, in the Coast Guard's history. Why? Why now? Well, the ships that they're replacing, some of them are 50 to 60 years old, and it, it's time, it's been time. Uh, we've had great uh, bipartisan support from our uh, overseers and you know authorizers and appropriators. The nation knows that they need the Coast Guard and we need to make that investment now. Part of that a modernization plan includes expanding the Arctic fleet. Tell us what the Coast Guard's role is in that region and how it's changing. Yeah, so we were just talking about the polar security cutters that uh, you know we are uh, on budget for uh, for those polar security cutters. You know, it's important to remind people that we are an Arctic nation. The state of Alaska uh, has a big and large uh, Arctic coastline, and so the polar security cutters are critical to our national security and national sovereignty as it pertains to, uh, to the Arctic. The Coast Guard has operated in the Arctic for a uh, for long, long time and have a great tradition of, uh, of operating there. Uh, I'm excited about the opportunity these polar security cutters are going to bring. They'll allow increased access and year-round presence into the high latitudes, into the, uh, into the Arctic. It's critical work for us as a nation. But have things become more um, uh, tense in the Arctic, given the war in Ukraine, things with Russia? I mean, they're also an, an Arctic nation. Yes, Russia is also an Arctic nation. And, uh, you know, China several years ago declared themselves as a uh, near-Arctic nation. A uh, lot of interest in the, in the Arctic from a just geopolitical standpoint. And so, Again, ensuring that we've got the presence to protect our own sovereignty is, uh, is important, and that's why these polar security cutters are so, uh, so critical. Uh, we, um, you know, we experience uh, almost daily interaction with the Russians as it pertains to the maritime boundary line. In fact, have very uh, cordial and professional uh, engagements, and that has not uh, changed uh, with regard uh, to the, you know, current, uh, the current situation. But again, ensuring that, that we're in a posture to protect our own uh, sovereignties and interests, and particularly as the Arctic uh, warms and sea ice recedes, there's just increased human activity up there. Cruise ships, uh, fish migration patterns are changing. You know, the many native communities that um, uh, need access to the water, and we need to ensure that they've got a safe environment to operate in, and it's all part of the role that the Coast Guard will play. The Coast Guard is also taking a more active role in the Pacific. What can you mm -hmm. tell me about what's happening there? Yeah, so um, I often get asked, they're like, well, you guys are the Coast Guard. Like, why are you... What are you the, doing all the way over there? What are you doing all the way over there? <laughs> uh, we are a globally deployed Coast Guard, and, you know, the risk uh, that uh, the country faces, it's not just, uh, you know, on our home shores. And so uh, Coast, the Coast Guard is operating in the Western uh, Pacific, uh, we've got cutters based in Hawaii and Guam that, uh, that, that work and engage with uh, our, our many uh, partner nations throughout the region. Uh, we're committed to a free and open Indo-PACOM. This is about rule of law, good governance. And as a Coast Guard, we demonstrate that maritime professionalism in all that we do and our partner choice for many of these uh, small, small nation uh, communities. And you're also replacing some aging cutters, as, as you mentioned before. There's the Waterways Commerce Cutter Program. Yeah, yeah. Talk about the importance of those inland waterways. Yeah, so, you know, we are, you know, we are a great maritime uh, nation, but we've got a significant uh, inland waterway system that, uh, that directly contributes to our uh, economic security and stability. Uh, you know, $5.4 trillion of economic benefit across uh, the maritime 
uh, you know, maritime realm here in the United States. And so the inland uh, waterway commerce cutters are just critical to ensuring that the, uh, the, the, the waterways are safe and resilient and reliable so that commerce can access them. The cutters that these new waterway commerce cutters will replace are, you know, 50 plus years old in many cases, don't accommodate mixed gender crews. And uh, it's time. We're excited, and uh, we very soon will be, uh, be be making an announcement with regard to the waterway commerce cutter. Let's talk about climate change. Obviously, the majority of your installations are on the coast. Yes. So, how have your operations been affected by that? Yeah. So, uh, you know, we are a maritime uh, service, military service, and uh, every Coast Guard operation uh, starts and then ends at a shore-based facility, and much of that infrastructure is right on the coast. Uh, where we do face challenge of, uh, you know, climate change, uh, sea level rise. And so we, as we invest in that infrastructure, are looking to do it in a way that increases resiliency. Uh, we've had uh, stations, small boat stations, uh, damaged by hurricanes. And when we've rebuilt them, we've done things like uh, moving the critical systems to a, a, an upper floor as opposed to a ground floor to keep them so that if the building floods, it's much easier to re reconstitute. And uh, as we look forward to all that uh, infrastructure investment, we're doing it in a way that's mindful of just the increased pace of change and ensuring that we've got resiliency around our infrastructure. At the same time, as climate disasters increase, hurricanes, flooding, all kinds of stuff like that, the Coast Guard's gonna be called upon more and more. So what are you doing to ramp up your capability? Yeah, so we are absolutely, we are a surge force. We're a maritime first response force. Uh, many people are familiar with the work that we do post hurricane, whether Harvey or uh, any kind of uh, you know, disaster that results in uh, people uh, whose lives may be uh, imperiled. We, uh, we remain committed uh, to that work. You know, hurricane season started on the 1st of June. Uh, we're in the in it now. If uh, you've looked, there's some activity in the uh, in the Atlantic, and uh, part of uh, my role and our operational commander's role is to ensure that we've got adequate surge capacity and force to to respond uh, to the American public and meet uh, their expectations if uh, if they find themselves endangered in a in a hurricane. And then on the other side of that, I wonder what you're doing to reduce the negative impact that the Coast Guard might have on the environment and on marine life? Yeah, so we're in the process of uh, putting together, you talked about my Commandant's intent and, and Commandant's uh, strategy. Uh, you know, we're looking at a uh, kind of climate strategy and part of that, in addition to improving resiliency around our infrastructure, is also looking at, uh, you know, our impact on the environment and, uh, you know, minimizing that. So that again, we are good stewards uh, of the environment, as well as being good stewards of the financial uh, resources that the uh, the public can trust us with. And as some waters um, warm up, the fish move. Yes. And you're heavily involved in in patrolling for illegal fishing. What what's the connection there? Yes. So uh, we do. Uh, we have a very active role in fisheries enforcement. We work with the uh, National Marine uh, Fisheries Service here in the U.S. Uh, protecting our own, uh, you know, fish stocks and natural resources. And then uh, further afield, and we've talked about the Western Pacific, uh, we have uh, bilateral agreements with a number of uh, different uh, nations where, we, you know, we bring one of their uh, sort of fisheries enforcers uh, onto our Coast Guard cutter and help them enforce their own uh, fisheries laws. We've published an IUUF, illegal unregulated, unreported uh, fishing strategy to help bring focus to this global uh, challenge and continue to work and partner to, uh, to improve that, uh, that situation. Admiral, I, I know that the, the Coast Guard's four-year strategy is coming out soon. It's not ready to be announced or public, but what are the major highlights from that? Yeah, so my Commandant's intent was out on day one, and now this, uh, this strategy will, will put much more detail uh, on that Commandant's intent. We've already talked about uh, the workforce work that we're doing. Uh, some of the highlights in the strategy that we're gonna publish, uh, we're, we're getting after uh, our data from a governance standpoint so that we can begin to uh, use AI, machine learning and predictive analytics around data uh, as it pertains to uh, you know, the increasing uh, challenge around our operating mission set and whether it's uh, counter narcotics or maritime migration ensuring that we're postured for success organizationally. I've also challenged the team 
uh, to look at how we are operating the force, uh, both from a uh, force management standpoint and then how and we decide to uh, uh, employ cutters in aircraft and small boats so that we're responsive to the American public and that we are responsive to the changing uh, risk uh, situation that we, we see around uh, the maritime uh, commons. And I want to talk about you specifically because you got your start um, after graduating from the Coast Guard <clears throat> Academy. Women were just starting to come into the Coast Guard. Talk about how the Coast Guard has changed and how you've seen that diversity play out. Yeah, so uh, I arrived at the Coast Guard Academy in 1981. We had only graduated the first class of women the year before. I did not realize how recent uh, that change had, uh, had been. Uh, I went to the Coast Guard Academy because I wanted to serve as an officer in the Coast Guard, and that was, that was my, my goal. I didn't have a plan. I didn't have much of a plan beyond that, just to graduate and be uh, commissioned. Uh, what I've seen in the time since I've graduated is the service continue to move forward, an increasing number of women coming, coming into the service. We onboarded the class of 2026 at the Coast Guard Academy uh, not that long ago, 43% women. My class was 5% women when I graduated, and I think that just speaks volumes uh, to the organization, uh, the commitment to providing uh, work that's valued and uh, in embracing all that people bring uh, in, in all of their diversity, and I'm really excited about it. Uh, it's a family affair for me. My daughter graduated in 2016. I was just going to ask you about that. She's a lieutenant in, in the Coast Guard. She is a lieutenant in the Coast Guard. She entered a Coast Guard that looked very different than the one that I entered. And uh, I'm excited uh, for her, uh, for the future of the organization, and, uh, and where we're going. I see nothing but opportunity in front of us and opportunity for anyone that uh, would be interested in, in serving the nation and joining just an incredible organization. One of your many accomplishments is that you're the first ever gold ancient trident. Yes. You're gonna have to explain that. <laughs> so uh, my uh, operational uh, specialty is, uh, you know, the, there is a trident in my, uh, my operational specialty as a marine, uh, a marine inspector. And so we have this ancient tradition. We have an ancient cutterman and uh, uh, station keeper and uh, aviator. Uh, so I'm the longest serving uh, individual in the marine uh, safety prevention field. I do, you know, I started doing barge inspections and cruise ship inspections. And somehow I find myself now with the term ancient. I don't feel ancient. I prefer seasoned, <laughs> but uh, here we are. <laughs> and you actually get a trident. I do, and it's uh, it's kind of like Neptune. Yeah, it looks like Neptune. <laughs> solid brass. It's very heavy, but uh, it's in my office. <laughs> so, so what advice do you give to other female leaders out there in the government? What do you tell them, uh, especially about working in a male-dominated yeah. field? I, you know, I would say, you know, be be yourself, uh, be bold, and uh, and you can do it. Right? It uh, this. Uh, Women, I think, bring a, just a great perspective into leadership. The, um, you know, your, your humanity and empathy always, uh, always carries the day. And, uh, and just, you know, you're, you're in the room for the reason. And uh, have, have an opinion, have a voice, and uh, just, just be, uh, be yourself. All right, Admiral Fagan, thank you so much for coming in. So nice to talk to you. All right, thank you, Mimi, thanks. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.